I have no slides. I couldn't compete with the slideshows I've seen today. 261 slides, that was unbelievable, right? Um, when I was a kid, and if you were like me, you probably can relate to this, on summer days when it was raining outside, at some point you may have put on a makeshift cape, and in some cases, underoos, or in some cases, makeshift underoos. And you ran around the house, and for that moment in time, you could save the world. Well, then life kind of gets in the way, right? You kind of recognize that I'm never going to be able to fly. I can't stop the meteor from hitting the earth. I will probably not be able to telepathically speak to the creatures in the sea. And if you're like me, you've succumbed to the fact that maybe you can't save the world. I did. I worked for an investment bank, and I was a real estate developer. That was most of my career. And I was on the treadmill, happily, running away. Then something really crazy happened. So a sidelight, because I have a bit of insomnia, I started writing scripts some years ago. And it just so happens I wasn't bad at it. First script I ever wrote got made into a film. Another script that I wrote was optioned uh, by a company called California Pictures. And so we made some edits to this script. And uh, then we had a script reading where we put nine actors on a stage. We get 75, 80 people to listen. And really, my job at that point is to watch the people listening. And um, I had made a couple of short films but I was on the treadmill, right? So the script reading occurs, and, and a gentleman comes up to me afterwards because part of the script touched on the issue of homelessness. It was not the main part of the script. And he says, hey, uh, what do you know about homelessness? Nothing. And he goes on for 40 minutes telling me about the issue of homelessness. And I was like, dude. How do you know so much about homelessness? It would have been like me speaking to any one of you. And he said, well, I was homeless for two years. Wow. What? I kind of walked away and scratched my head and said, wow, that's interesting. This guy is really the exception to the rule. Three weeks later, I'm at my daughter's school. And through a conversation with my daughter and her teacher, now mind you, I don't live in the Bronx. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. They tell me that there are four homeless kids in the class. In the class? What? So I went home and I told my wife about these two incidences that were so out of the ordinary. And my wife, Jenny, being my wife, says, well, what's ordinary? I said, well, everybody knows why people are homeless. They're drug addicts, they're alcoholics, they're mentally ill, or they want to be there. That's why people are homeless. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Central Michigan graduate, smart guy, of course I'm sure. So this conversation goes on for a while, and then finally I decide, finally Jenny tells me, what you're going to do is you're going to find an expert that's going to tell you about this, and we'll see what the truth is. So I did a little research, and I called the National Coalition for the Homeless. And I got a guy on the phone named Michael Stoops. And I said to Michael Stoops, Michael, this is going to be about a 10-minute conversation. I'm going to tell you what I know, and you're going to verify that I'm right. <laughs> Two hours later, I kept hearing the words come out of his mouth. That's what a lot of people think, Mr. Morgan, but it simply isn't the truth. 70% of the homeless population you would never know is homeless. The 30% that you see on the street is simply the ones who have given up trying to hide the fact that they're homeless. Well, I was so sure that Michael was wrong, I called back and got his boss. 
And I said to Neil Donovan, the executive director, hey, you got one guy that I'm not sure should be answering the phone. <laughs> same conversation, same two hours. Finally, Neil says, Mr. Morgan, thanks for calling. But I've got a meeting I was supposed to be at 30 minutes ago. Well, I'm soft, emotionally. I'm soft. That bothered me. This information, this bothered me. Like, to the point, I, I have insomnia, but it wasn't even fun to be up in the middle of the night, because that's all I could think about, especially when it came to my daughter, so close. So I can't go into all the details because of the short time, but I can tell you, finally what happened is, I came home to my wife and I said, I gotta make a documentary film on homelessness in the United States. And I wanna quit my job, and I wanna sell our house, and I wanna downsize our entire lives to do this. And my wife, being my wife, Jenny says, of course, of course. So we did, all of the above. And we got a crew together out of Los Angeles, and they traveled from Los Angeles to New York profiling America's homeless. We had another crew out of Charlotte that kind of pinballed across the country, and there's so many stories in there that I wish I could tell you they're unbelievable. But there's one particular interview that sticks with me all the time. In Washington, D.C., there's a man named Stephen Thomas, and Stephen is a big man, six foot three, 300 pounds. And he talks about it, 51 years old. He says, you know what, 51 years old, when I find myself sitting on that bench, he said, no, I was not raised to be homeless. Everybody in my family was successful. Six foot three, 300 pounds, I sat on that bench. I didn't want my mom. I didn't want my mother. I wanted my mommy. I want somebody to hold me and say, son, everything's going to be all right, because I was scared. He's crying down his face. We're all crying down our faces. But then he went on, and what was incredible is he said, you know, so after 18 months of being homeless, I decided I was going to take my life, and I had a gun. And that night I was going to, I was going to end it. He said, but amazing thing happened. This guy came up and he crawled down under that bench where I was and he engaged me in conversation and then he said words I'll never forget. He said, would it be okay if I help you? And it blew me away. Now this man probably wasn't wearing a cape. He probably wasn't wearing underoos. But he changed his life. Now the point to that is the ripple effect of what that man did, probably not knowing what he did that night, is unbelievable. Stephen Thomas now is a, one of the leading speakers at the National Coalition for the Homeless, advocate for the homeless, has helped change policy in Washington, D.C. about homelessness and the way we see homelessness. So for that day, that man had a cape. You just couldn't see it. Well, what I found over that journey about myself was that my kryptonite was judgment. I saw everything through the filter of me. How does this affect me? And in that journey, I hurt and I cried. Man, I cried. I never cried so much in my life. I cried just thinking about crying. But I felt the pain of these people. And what's interesting is most of their lives paralleled my life to a certain point, and then something went horribly wrong. They didn't set out to be homeless. They ended up there. So I came back home, and we're finishing this film, and I meet this woman at a dinner, and she's sitting over in the corner. And I went over, and I said, well, you know, what do you do? She goes, well, I'm from Nepal. I'm like, oh, interesting. And um, 
She said, I have a little nonprofit in Nepal. And she said, what I try to do is take children out of prison. I said, why are they putting children in prison in Nepal? What kind of country is that? Well, no, 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 in Nepal, if a parent is sentenced to prison and they don't have a guardian for their children, the children go with them and sit on the prison floor. And so she said, I walked through at age 21 and I saw this during my university studies. What's amazing about Pushpa is that this little eight-month-old girl pulled on her shawl and looked her in the face and smiled. And she said, she never said a word, but that look on her face, she told me, you can't leave me. Pushpa had a couple of problems. She came from a higher caste, which very traditionally, you don't serve a lower caste. It's problem number one. Secondly, she's a woman in Nepal. And women in Nepal are not really leaders, they're followers. That's traditional, very traditional Nepalese. She didn't care. She started this organization. She has raised over 100 kids that have come through her organization and gone back to their families. She has 55 kids that live with her now. When we started the interviewing process and we started documenting all of this, she was one of 45,000 CNN Hero nominees, like Jackson. And she won in 2012 the CNN Hero of the Year. She's unbelievable. But when you talk to her, she says, my satisfaction comes from having these kids at the greatest time of their lives. They're kids. She doesn't wear a cape either. And I know she doesn't wear underoos, I guarantee you. But the impact that these people can have on lives the impact that we all can have on lives, the ripple effect of what happens. She saves these kids who now are educated. A hundred kids have come and gone, and she still pays for their education, even when they're back with their families. I said to her, I said, you get a discount for 55 kids in school? <laughs> she said, you know what, they've offered me a discount, but I do not take it. I said, why wouldn't you take it? She said, when I go in there with a problem with my child, I want to be treated like everybody else. Hmm. Pretty smart, 28 years old. I wouldn't have thought of that. But the ripple effect, the ripple effect, the ripple effect is amazing. So I play this game with my kids. And I just come up and tell stories, right? I, the amazing things that we've seen today are incredible and the work that they've done. But this game, I started playing by myself. It's called 100 Good Deeds. And it's simple. You can take it with you today. You can steal it. You can have it. The game is this. 100 good deeds in a year. Here's what counts. It counts if you have to go out of your way to do it. If you're opening a door that you're walking through, that does not count. If you run across the street to help somebody, that counts. The second thing is, if you tell anybody about it or you're acknowledged for it, that does not count. So my daughter says, Dad, can we talk about how it makes us feel? That we can talk about. What it does, though, for me is it gets me out of me. I quit thinking about me, and I start thinking about people around me and the effect that I can have. And who knows what the ripple effect of 100 good deeds is, or one good deed. So I have this opportunity every day, and it's a silly game, right? It's as simple as giving up your first-class seat when you get the upgrade to somebody who you know will never fly first class in their life. People think you're crazy. It is fantastic. Because suddenly what happens is they start thinking, well, what have I done? Right? By not doing anything, they're like, wow, wait, I should do something. But it's the little things like that that we can do every single day. Right? We can't all be pushba, but we can be something. We can think of something. So really, for me, the ripple effect is simple. It comes down to this. How big a rock can you throw in the water? You decide. But because we can help, we must. Thank you.